and the adoption of the agenda for the 11th September 2023 <clears throat> Whitnell School Board Workshop with Action meeting. Uh, roll call, please. <clears throat> Here. Jesse? Here. Kevin? Present. Quinn? Yes. Jesus. Here. And Rachel Shear is not available. We wish her condolences in the untimely death within her family. So please rise as we pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. So public item regarding agenda items will take place after the item is discussed. So no comments at this time, but they will happen uh, along with the item that is talked. So moving along to number three, staff, student, and donation recognitions. Letter A, employee recognition. I'm going to have Mrs. Comas first come up. Uh, we have several employees that we are recognizing tonight and just giving a brief um, overview of what their recognition is about. So I'm going to ask um, Lori Comas, the principal at Hales Corners Elementary, to um, share with us the good news about Lynn Lopez. introducing Lynn Lopez and sharing a recent accomplishment that has brought her to the school board for recognition this evening. Lynn teaches third grade um, English language arts at Hales Corners Elementary and she's been teaching at HCE since 2015. Lynn has always been very passionate about literacy which makes her the perfect teacher to specialize in teaching our younger students reading and writing each day, all day. Lynn um, recently attended Carroll University uh, last year during the entire year and, and earned a certificate as a structured literacy dyslexia interventionist. She's certified through CIRA, which is the Center for Effective Reading Instruction. And that is a subsidiary of the um, International Dyslexia Association. Lynn plans to take the training that she has um, gained and the knowledge that she's um, lear learned over the course of the year to implement within our micro-credential system in the upcoming school year. So please join me in congratulating <coughs> Lynn for her dedication to her own continued learning. <laughs> she's choosing not to say it. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, Charlie Tillerson will come and uh, speak about uh, Kevin Gleason, one of our high school social studies teachers. All right. <clears throat> so I get the, pro the pleasure to uh, introduce Kevin Gleason, who is one of our social studies teachers. Uh, Kevin has just completed all the requirements for his James Madison Fellowship. So the James Madison Fellowship is a scholarship um, of the amount of $24,000 for a master's level education program. And it's for individuals desiring to become outstanding teachers of the American Constitution at the secondary school level. Uh, fellowship applicants compete against other applicants from the state of Wisconsin, uh, and each state represents uh, through the, the fellowship. Um, and then uh, he received funding for his uh, master's degree in political science from Marquette University. Congrats. Congratulations. And I'm going to um, introduce our last two groups of employees. So Josh Koenigs, I suppose I should come up here and stand here if I'm going to do this. And then I have to come over here too, so. I see that he has a couple of his fellow colleagues behind him who are here supporting him and his supervisor also Todd Iverson who is here. So. Josh, um, a little bit more than recently, but uh, went and picked that up. He um, serves as our head custodian here at Whitnell High School, and he's been at Whitnell um, for several years here. Um, Josh just earned the Wisconsin Association of School Business Officials Facilities Management Core Certification um, that required 32 hours of curriculum. Um, and some of the topics that um, were in that curriculum are 
changing legislation and regulations around facility management, savings of dollars through efficiencies of operation and energy use, improved safety for students, staff, and community, and a healthy and safe learning environment. So congratulations, Josh, on that, uh, achieving that certification. Many of you also remember that Josh uh, received an award from the Wisconsin Athletic Directors Association for being uh, a friend of that, um, and our booster club has given him also many accolades for the work that he does and supports them. So congratulations. Congratulations. I don't see any of our food service people here if I'm not seeing you. There you are, come on up. Then I'm gonna go there, I couldn't see you. Come on up. <laughs> Snuck in with all the faces. There you go, thank you. So there were eight of our food service um, people who in June, right after school was out, um, sat for um, a food service certification. They're, um, uh, safe serve food um, protection manager. So each time any restaurant or any organization that serves food is required to have at least one person who has this. And so we had eight people who um, went through their um, uh, training over two days and 90 question tests, is that correct? Um, that allows them, so this is more than just serving it, they actually have their safe serve manager certification. So this uh, makes sure that all of our food safety is here, their knowledge to protect all of our public, our students and our staff from any foodborne illnesses and all of that, and it's good for five years. So we had eight of our staff that completed that and wanted to recognize all of our food service staff that went through that. So congratulations and thank you for joining us this morning. Fantastic. Four reports and presentations. Letter A, student council report. Uh, you go right there. Okay. Hi. Hello. Um, good evening. My name is Itzel Sepulveda, and I am the student council president. Although we have just gotten started on this year's planning, which was met with a lot of enthusiasm, um, we have been discussing homecoming, which includes the week's lunch games, pep rally, parade, banners for the parade, window decorating, t-shirt selling, and the actual dance itself. Other than homecoming, we will also be having the haunted hallways in October and a blood drive around December. We have yet to speak about second semester, but we do know that this year the student council wants to have more events for students to attend to connect the student body more. We haven't fully finalized anything yet, but we have had broad discussions about having student movie nights and a garage sale to fundraise for dances. And I speak on behalf of the student council when I say that we look forward to your support as we continue to strengthen the community at Wendell High School. Thank you. How's your uh, support for all the grades? Is everybody getting involved? Uh, yes, we had a lot of freshmen this year. Oh, good. Good for you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Letter B, annual meeting preview with John Doerr. Good evening, every, good evening everybody. Uh, tonight, just like I did last year, wanted to present a little bit about what to expect for the, the budget hearing and annual meeting that'll be coming up uh, on, uh, in se on September, uh, at the end of September at our, at our next uh, meeting. And uh, to be able to clarify, answer any questions for both you and, and all of these people that will be here for that night for the budget meeting or budget hearing and annual meeting. So, um, Again, just to reiterate or review kind of the state statutes that we're required to do um, by law and uh, provide you with that, th those links. Um, those are the things that we cover during uh, the budget hearing and annual meeting. Uh, I'll, cr I'll create another booklet or a booklet again this year that will have these inf this information in there for, for you and anybody that's in attendance to look at uh, and, and be able to see. Uh, remember that, that this is um, uh, uh, what we, the, the projected budget um, and the projected information that we have that we did that you did approve in the published budget uh, at the, the last board meeting. So we don't have final numbers. We still have projected state aid, property valuation, tax levy, and mill rate. Um, and we'll talk about a, a little bit more uh, in the next slide as well about some of the things that we're that we'll know we'll need to get. Uh, it also um, will list the approved budget that you did approve in in August. So you'll you'll be able to see that along with anybody else that's in attendance. 
So remember that we won't have uh, final membership counts, equalized value, state aid, voucher payments, uh, which we do expect to probably go up this year because of the, the state budget amounts. Uh, final open enrollment numbers, all of these will be will get in October. And also remember that at the end of October, at the end of October's board meeting, you will approve a final levy uh, and a final budget. So again, what we're using for the annual meeting was the best information we had uh, in August when you approved the published budget but we will be getting uh, more accurate numbers at the end of October uh, that you'll also approve at that meeting. Uh, so as far as the process goes, I'll start off the budget hearing process um, or procedure that night at 530. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, it's at 530, isn't it? I think it's at 530. Today? Uh, 630 right there. Yeah, it does say 630, but I think it's 530. Did we start that it's your early? slides, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you call the shot, John. <clears throat> All right. You told me 5:30 today, and I don't know. I did. I thought that we started it early that day because then there's a board meeting after it. I'll double check on that and let let you and everybody know. I don't want anybody to be late. <laughs> um, so. Uh, I'll start off the budget hearing either at 5.30 or 6.30, and again, I'll let you know on that. Uh, I do think we started at 5.30 earlier because we do have a, a, the annual meeting and then a board meeting afterwards. Um, and then, so what we're going to have is, is the podium set up and, and microphone set up, so uh, that way people who are listening online can hear the questions. Uh, they will be able to answer any ask any questions about the proposed budgets and items that I'm going over, as well as... Um, uh, anything that uh, that's in the packet. Um, and then once all those qu questions are answered as I've gone through all of the information in the packet and the presentation, uh, we'll move right into the annual meeting. And again, th the annual meeting is really a set of, uh, we do six resolutions or you do six resolutions that you'll need to uh, consider and approve. Uh, those are listed on the on the slides right there. Uh, we'll, we'll get the information uh, on numbers one and number two that will come from the information that I present in the annual meeting, or I'm sorry, in the budget meeting. Uh, and the other ones are things that we do annually just so that, um, the, 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 according to state statute, that you need to approve every year. So again, that doesn't change, um, and, and we'll have discussion and, uh, and resol resol the opportunity to pass a resolution on those other four items as well. Uh, the bottom down at the bottom is just an example of what number one lo will, will look like um, based on the published <coughs> published budget. Uh, all residents uh, that are eligible to vote uh, that are eligible to vote need to sign in at the beginning of the uh, of the be beginning of the meeting, um, and then also as well after we've nominated a chairperson um, that they'll run those meetings and go through the six resolutions. Uh, any any voting member can uh, make a motion and or ask any questions, um, but they also utilize the podium as well so everybody can hear who's online. Um, and then after those, uh, after each discussion item and for each resolution, uh, you'll vote um, to pass those or the, or the, the, the voting members will vote uh, to pass that. Um, and then... Um, uh, when those or when and if those are all approved um, those six items are what are, are the the uh, with the entire consistency of the uh, annual meeting so and then after that um, as I mentioned before uh, if I have any new information on October 9th at that board meeting I'll present any information to you so that um, you have that but then uh, on the October 25th meeting um, that's when you'll finalize the final levy uh, and the final mill rate um, that night Any questions for Mr. Drew? You're projecting that we have, uh, we're going to have more voucher outs this year? I, 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 because that's of the raise in, raise in dollars? Correct. Do you have any idea? I, I don't. I don't. I, they, they increased it significantly at the mm -hmm. 912 and, and well, at all levels, but especially the 912. I just assume, but I, but I don't know. I don't have a specific number. Okay. Thank you. Nothing for me. Thank you. Oops. Nothing here. Yes. Uh, say again, we'll get the booklet on the night of, but we could look at it before. Um, um, yeah, I'll have it. I'll have it done okay. before that. That, that. Well, it'll be part of the... For next uh, week? Um, I don't know that it'll, it'll be no? okay. total next week, but... Okay. But yeah, I'll... Because I'll, it'll... I'll, I'll put it in the... In the... Um, packet. Packet. Okay. Yep. Karen? I don't have any questions. Thank you. Um, for the October 9th, do you anticipate any sort of new information that you'd get, or is it 
would that be really out, out of the ordinary of where you would see like, oh, here's all sorts of different information for you to share? Or would that be just, all right, I don't have anything yet. I anticipate getting it, but... Yeah, but most of that's going to depend on when DPI puts puts the information out. Uh, a lot of that doesn't come out until October fifteenth. I do have feel like I'll, I, I do know that that between working with Kathy Poss and myself, that we'll have a pretty good understanding of what Third Friday counts were. So that'll help with some of that. But but that's really the extent of any, and that's not even certified yet by DPI. But still, we'll have a really good number a good idea about what that number yeah, is. Pretty close. Yeah, for for enrollment only, but really state aid and vouchers and any of that other stuff probably not probably won't have anything on the ninth. But you you feel very confident that your numbers are going to be very much within like the ballpark as far as that goes. Um, well, I, I do. There's some, going to be some final things with with um, salary and benefits and the, <laughs> those final numbers that'll come back out. Um, they gave a projection on July 1 what the state aid was going to be. It'll, it'll be a, diff, a little bit different, but I don't expect them to, to do a, to have a, a, a really a big gap in that. As as yeah, that. so, and again, vouchers are, are going to be wait to see. I do expect them to go up. How much, I don't know. So, but uh, yeah, I feel like we're in the ballpark of, of, of all of that. And again, by, by at third Friday count in September, we should have a pretty good idea on, uh, on enrollment. So. Very good. Thank you, sir. Uh, letter C, superintendent's report. Dr. Olson. Just a few items. Uh, tomorrow we have our monthly SWSA meeting. Um, uh, just recently the Senate introduced Senate Bill 429. So as you know, uh, public schools currently cannot start school before September 1st. Um, that's <coughs> gone through the Tourism Bureau. Uh, legislators are not willing to change that. However, there's been a bill that's been introduced, um, 429, that said that schools could start the Monday before Labor Day as long as they did not have school the Friday before Labor Day. Um, so it just was introduced, so I'm sure we will be talking about that tomorrow and thinking about that implication. As you know, there are a few reasons why schools can make the exception a lot of times when they have construction projects they are allowed so DPI does have some exceptions so that was new um, this is one of those years where September 1st was on a Friday we were one of the school districts that chose to have school some didn't and it's it always gets tricky I think you know I like the um, consistency of saying it's always the Monday before Labor Day rather than the calendar date because next year September 1st falls on the weekend so we won't start after Labor Day but this would go into a place for the 24 25 school year so if this if this bill got traction, it would actually, uh, it could impl uh, impact next school year. So that's an interesting piece. As most of you know, our high school athletics already start mm -hmm. on the beginning of August, and so that families are always uh, there too. So it'll be interesting. It was recently, I haven't, we haven't had much discussion about that um, in groups. So that's just something I wanted to put on the board's radar that would impact um, our school calendar decision making. Um, lots of conversations that I'm participating in around teacher shortages and what's happening with a lot of different groups. The Wisconsin Policy Forum has um, something coming up. There's also a group from the School Personnel Association in Madison along with a couple other groups. Um, in, in looking at that and what's real strategies rather than just talking about it, what are some strategies that we can put in place for that? Partnerships with higher ed or what does that look like without compromising quality of um, teachers? <coughs> Um, and so it's, it's a real pipeline shortage. Um, and so what do we do about that? So some conversations, I'll share those once I um, participate in uh, a lot of those conversations. Um, Act 20, which is the literacy bill, um, still has some details being filled out. DPI has their website up now that you can reference that for any of the literacy information to get information about what does this mean, how are we translating it. So there is still some questions about what the plans look like that we will have to have in place for Actually, it's the kids in 28-29. Um, we're in a solid place right now with our recent literacy adoption and a lot of those things, but there are still some holes missing as far as what does that look like, what does that mean for implications for summer school even next year. So it's very early. We don't have details on that. Um, legislators, as they often do, provide it to DPI and tell them to figure it out so they are in the process of it. The fact that there's a website you can go to with that. Um, we've been listening to um, people from DPI. There are slides that I shared with the board over the weekend from DPI with their uh, recent information. Um, and so we'll continue to keep our eyes on that. But right now there's not as much detail as I think a lot of school districts would like. 
Today is September 11, and all of our schools' um, buildings did have announcements. They were taking uh, um, some information in classrooms, and obviously, developmentally, depending upon the age of students, different conversations were had on that. So today, about a day of remembrance, and as we know, they've switched it to a National Day of Service today, and so that information was shared in all of our, our buildings. Um, some even had a moment of silence. So just wanted to share that out, since we don't often have a board meeting right on September 11th. Um, homecoming, I think as was shared with you, August 6th and 7th, we will have our second um, induction of Hall of Fame. A Hall of Fame. They get introduced at halftime at the football game on Friday night, and then on Saturday there is a ceremony for our next class of inductees for our Whitnall Athletic Hall of Fame. So more information about that coming, but that falls in all of uh, that weekend of homecoming festivities. Last year we had our inaugural class. So. Uh, and last thing I just wanted to share is that we started this last week on Thursday, uh, district office administrators going into buildings every Thursdays from um, 11 until 1, bringing food doesn't hurt. So part of that is to just uh, be available um, to any employees who want to come in and chat or ask a question or just being visible. So I love that, sort of that, that making sure that it's on my calendar to get in to visit. So um, I had the opportunity of being Edgerton Elementary, so you're going to get a shout out just because that was my building that I started out with last week. So recess in every classroom and multiple, um, and my favorite part, like when I go into the lunchroom, when kids come up to me and like, can I use the bathroom? And I'm like, sure. And I'm like, I don't know, could I do that? But I just did that. So like, there was probably, like, that just wasn't the rule. So, but it was fun. It was great to be in there and watching all of there. I was able to sit in a lot of classrooms and see some of the new um, lessons being taught with the Wonders curriculum. And so that was great also. So every Thursday, we're rotating different buildings in that. So more information on that. That's all I have for my report. Thank you. Moving on to five, discussion with possible action. Letter A, student gender identity, parental notification, and consent with <clears throat> Karen McLinus. Okay, so I am introducing this model policy for the board's review and consideration. Um, some background. In, during the first few days of school, um, several high school parents expressed concerns that their children were asked to identify and announce their pronouns during class introductions and were asked to share their pronouns on getting to know you type assignments online. I have also seen a photo of a sign up for an extracurricular activity that asks students which pronouns would you prefer during the activity. I have suggested that the parents with those concerns reach out to the high school uh, regarding their concerns. And I acknowledge that the board does not work at the school level, we work at the policy level. I am choosing to introduce a policy proposal at the board level to provide clarity around the board's expectations to the administration and staff. Right now, it appears that there is no specific direction on this and it seems that there may be some confusion around what is expected as well as a potential disconnect between staff and administration around what is expected and what is happening. I feel that direction from the board from the top of the organization via policy will give administrators needed clarity for running the district. I will add that I feel that this is an urgent issue to address now to provide clarity for this school year. Um, I think that we should talk about this and I am not afraid of having difficult conversations. Mm. So the following is a sample policy that I'm proposing because it establishes some very simple instructions and expectations. I feel that is straightforward and easy to understand. I will add that this is a model policy written by the Wisconsin Institute of Law and Liberty, um, which is a group of lawyers. It was not specifically developed for Whitnall. These model policies are made public for school boards to use as a resource. So I will read the paragraphs. Paragraph one states, parents have the right to, de to determine the names and pronouns that staff use to refer to their children while at school. Staff shall not refer to or address minor students by a different name or pronouns that differ from their biological sex during school hours without written authorization from a parent. The document authorizing the change of name and or pronoun shall be kept on file in the administrative offices. This policy does not require parental consent for shortened versions of the legal name of a student. 
So I will just comment on the first paragraph. Um, how I understand this paragraph is to mean that we are going to include parents in their child's education. Um, the 14th Amendment gives parents the right to be involved in their children's education. And I feel that it is important that schools do not keep secrets from parents. I think that there are ways to handle, um, handle things with compassion, to handle students um, with compassion if they're struggling. Um, I think that there are ways to perhaps <coughs> help students um, have, if they need to have difficult conversations with their parents, that we have staff who are very capable of helping students through some of that. Um, but ultimately, that parents are partners in education. And I feel that this lays that out very clearly. Paragraph two says, the district shall not diagnose or treat gender dysphoria. The board acknowledges that district personnel are not experts in diagnosing or treating gender dysphoria or related mental health conditions. Parents have the right to, to determine whether to seek professional and medical support for their child. I think this is very straightforward. It probably doesn't need additional explanation. Paragraph three states, if district personnel have reason to believe that a student is seeking to transition or has begun to socially transition to a gender that differs from his or her biological sex, personnel may but are not required to inform parents. So I'm just gonna speak a little bit. I think that this is an interesting way of, um, an interesting language here, this personnel may but are not required to inform parents. And so I, I asked about this because I thought it was a, sort of a unique way of describing this. And uh, so this is my understanding. Um, a school district in Madison put forward a policy that forbade staff from talking to parents and that generated some lawsuits. So it, it basically required that school staff would keep secrets from parents. Um, that caused problems. In looking at some things that are happening around the country, you can see that there's school districts in California that are passing policies that insist on notification. There must be a letter sent to parents within so many days. Um, this, uh, this you know, model policy um, gives the school some dic discretion in how they might handle this situation. And it could be, um, there might be administrative guidelines written to help on this, um, but there is room for discretion. Um, however, I'm going to also suggest the main idea that parents are, are partners and, and, and need to be involved in their children's lives. Um, so that is an overview of the model policy that I'm putting forward. Um, Jason, Mr. President, I would suggest that <coughs> the board may have some continued discussion around this model policy um, and conduct a policy committee meeting. I would suggest um, Monday, September 18th, following the finance and facilities committee meeting for some additional discussion if you would like to do that. Otherwise, I would suggest an option of having a, a second reading discussion and a vote at the August 25th board meeting. Um, so I think that this is important to have this, uh, this first public um, sort of pers pub public statement about the policy so people are aware and the district is transparent. Well, let's have discussion. We'll start with... What are we having discussion about? Is there a motion on the floor? I don't believe... Do you have a motion that you'd like to put forward? Not at this time, thank you. And why are we having a discussion? To see if there is something... If if there is anything. Would you like to make a motion? No. I, we, this shouldn't be in front of us. If we are... if If... 
we are following our policy, and I heard policy out of your name several times, out of your mouth. This shouldn't even be in front of us. This should go, we should follow our policies. Policy 0131-1 tells us exactly what to do if something comes to us, right? Policy 5710 talks about a student complaint. I hear you in your email saying, and tonight, I've heard, or people have told you, have they gone through the cha chain of command? I don't know. <clears throat> we have to follow our own policies first before any of this can come to us. This is out of, out of order. We should not even be discussing this. Do you understand that Kell Moraine School District at current time is in federal litigation regarding this policy? We also talk about our staff, how great our staff is, how we want to hear from our staff. Well, we got about 20 emails or so hearing from our staff. So we're not, we don't want to listen to them now. We don't want to involve the whole community in this discussion. We want to bring it there. Dem and Karen demanded, demanded that this be on the agenda and you allowed it? You're the chair of the policy committee. You should know the policies. Bang, it should have went right, right there. It should not be here. I'm done. Get your hand raised, sir. Yeah, uh, Quinn already stated this viol violates our policy and procedures. I understand why we're caving to demands of one board member to put something on an agenda when I believe this board member, Karen, is on the policy committee. Jason, you're the chair of the policy committee, yet you ignored the policies, threw it on as a potential action item, which pretty much has no transparency or community input because if someone were to make a motion tonight, we'd vote on it and all the comments would come after because that makes any sense. Um, I have no idea why we're talking about this, why this is an urgent matter. And we talk about, <clears throat> you know, following policies and listening to our community and we're gonna go ahead and write a policy or take one from some law firm about, uh, based off of hearsay, and I'm hearing, and this is what I heard. We heard from the community, I don't know how, Quinn said about 20, it was probably more than that of emails that talked about how there is no tolerance for, or appetite for any such thing like this. I mean, why are we trying to create a problem where there is no problem? And trying to just, you know, put our children in difficult situations <clears throat> you know we have on the is it on the wall over there it says advancement belonging and courage i don't know how forcing through this policy or a policy like this fulfills any of that stuff i'm looking right here at our uh our witnell school meeting board uh, our board meeting protocols number one best interest of children always comes first and yet here we are forcing things through or attempting to, but then backtracking when they realize they're wrong. It's just, it's so ridiculous and unnecessary that we're trying to create something out of nothing. Um, but I do wanna thank everybody in the community that sent emails and gave public comments or probably signed up to give public comments. Um, there was some extensive research and great input and very well written and to the point that I often hear of, <clears throat> you know, we don't get to hear from our staff. We had several staff members, they worked within policy and did the appropriate thing to put their voices forward, and we saw that. So I don't, I don't even know what we're doing with this. This is nonsense. That's it for me. I'm just as blindsided by this as everybody else. It came out of nowhere. It came based on hearsay. We're all about investigations these days. Why didn't we look into that first? start there if that was such a big issue but we immediately jumped to this from where this is a waste of everybody's time it gets people to show up for something because they're worried about it and they should be and you're wasting their time by skipping all the policies that we have in place you have these people that are passionate about these things and i appreciate them coming out and wanting to be heard but you're wasting people's time by not following the right way to do things here we have the policy committee in place for a reason. We have NEOLA, we have legal, that all this stuff gets run by that provide input. 
and we're skipping all of that and we're just saying, hey, this, this is a good rough draft, maybe a little bit of tweaks, but then it's good to go. No, that's not how we do things here, and I, I'm completely against this, and this, I echo them. This is a waste of time. I have a statement from Rachel Scher because she can't be here tonight, and I would just like to read that for her. Um, I cannot support any board policy language that originated from a political action committee. The Whitnell School District is a public institution, and its policy should be independent of such influence. In my opinion, this language does not take into account the unique personal experience of each individual student. While I respect the concerns and rights of the parents of our students, there is research that supports the assertion that healthy relationships between <coughs> teachers and students are one of the cornerstones of student success. I believe that such a policy places teachers in an unnecessary exposed position and undermines their, their critical relationship building with students. In my 25 years as an educator, I have never seen evidence of a teacher that was indoctrinating students. For the most part, teachers want to connect with students because they understand that when kids feel safe, they are empowered to achieve at a higher level. When teachers consistently prioritize building strong connections with students, research show, shows there's a significant impact on kids' long-term well-being as well as their ability to learn and stay engaged in schools. Learning doesn't happen without relationships, writes Rebecca Albner, Alber, an instructor at UCLA's Graduate School of Education. In the classroom, rules matter, but as many of us have learned after a few years teaching, relationships matter much more. I think this is a critical issue that needs a nonpartisan approach. Madam Vice President. Quinn, what was the first policy referenced? One three one. Zero one no three one. I just want to. One. I want to make sure I heard it correctly. Policy and then policy five seven one zero student complaints. Okay. And if you want to go even deeper, policy nine one three zero, public requests, suggestions, or complaints. Okay, so um, just when I'm reading that one, Jason, for for my first reaction, um, I don't see it I don't see anything outside of the bounds it might not be what typically happens yeah I'm reading the second paragraph so anyway um, it states things like the board may adopt amend or suspend any bylaw or policy provided the amendment adoption or suspension does not co conflict with well law. we need to take the whole policy Hold on. you need to I hold, the read the whole policy not just pieces of it I have the floor that being said, do you want us to comment on this if we have a position? The policy or the so, this proposal. agenda item. The proposal? Yeah, the agenda item. Uh, Rachel commented on the the proposal, so I Okay. I see I'm Sensing some reactions from my colleagues about my reading this policy, and I mean, I I don't see any of what they're saying, so I'll read it again and again and again. But in the meantime, um, I heard from through the grapevine a little bit and um, directly as well that there were some concerns out there was kind of ruminating on them, thinking about them, and then this ended up on an agenda, and then the floodgates opened. And what was originally a concern from a couple families about one or two classes turned into several staff uh, taking a position about, um, I guess, in conflict with what we were told was a procedure or an expectation by administration. So that being said, in preparation for today, I have a couple thoughts on this. And I, I'm really struggling with the position that um, you are either supportive of students or telling parents. That deeply troubles me as a parent. Um, and I'm of the position and will remain in the position that parents are the ultimate decision makers regarding their children. That is, that is my position, it will not change. That being said, I've been in staff shoes too. I was a high school teacher for a long time. 
there were instances when the parent of a struggling student made decisions I didn't necessarily agree with. But what I did know at the end of the day was that the only hope I had to try to get students the support they needed when they were struggling was to get the parents on board. And the way that I could do that as an educator was to build a relationship with the kid and build a relationship with their family. Nothing that I could do in the classroom could ever take care of the 23 other hours of the day if that child was not getting the support that they needed from their family. My role as an educator was not to keep secrets from a family about a struggling student. I'm a parent now, and I'm deeply troubled that any adult would be willing to keep secrets with my kids from me. I also want to state and take issue with the suggestion or characterization that informing parents about what is going on with their kid in a classroom puts that child's life in danger. I have heard no instances here in the Whitmer School District where a child's life was in danger by being informed or by having their parents informed. Without data, I'm really struggling with the fact that we have seen so many staff <coughs> view average Whitnell parents as violent, abusive, or harmful to their children. And that is what we saw, and I have concerns about that. And what we also saw is that there are a lot of staff, more than I was aware of in the one or two instances I heard, that are operating outside of an expectation. So I will stop there, but I will state. I'd like, I'd like you to finish whatever your thoughts are. That's, yeah, that, that's the completion of my thought. Parents um, have a right to know people should not be keeping secrets with children from their parents. Uh, my thoughts on this are, I echo the Vice President's uh, beliefs about the idea that we shouldn't be keeping secrets from parents, period. Um, if we are, the question then becomes, what is the line? At what point do you say that's, that's something that should be shared with, with the parents? I don't have that line. If there is something with any of my children, I want to know about it. And if there's a belief that, well, this can be kept as a secret, okay, well, where does it stop? Where do you say, you know what, now you should be told about this? That's not something that I believe in either, um, because if it's a pronoun use, okay. If it's how much Advil they take in a day. Right. If all of a sudden a high school sophomore is getting text messages at 1130 at night from a member of staff, is that okay to keep as a secret? I'm, I struggle to think of that being a, because that would be a line that I would say, yeah, I don't know of any parent that would be like, you know what, that's okay to be kept as a secret from me. My other side of it is, is that there isn't a policy for our educators as a whole uh, as far as what to do. There is guidance, there is expectation levels, but there isn't anything for the educators. And if you have two students that have gender dysphoria and one teacher goes with the same process for both children, there is a very real possibility that depend on the family's beliefs and their views, one family can say that this is the teacher of the year, and another family that'll say that this teacher has no right to do what they did. And that puts the teacher in an impossible situation as far as that goes. I also am a little concerned that there is the belief that other parents within the community are these violent monsters. <clears throat> and if they are, name them, point them out, call CPS. That there is a mechanism for the school that they are required to, to report any sort of real child abuse, that has to happen. 
So that's my view on this. Yes. Jason, if I can just add a couple of things. Um, I, I, I just want to add that I think that we, we need to be creative and think about how we can have both things. How can we show compassion to children? How can we include the parents in the conversation? I don't think it's either or. I think that we need to figure out how we can have both things at the same time. And um, <coughs> I do think that our staff and administration are compassionate and caring people. I understand that that's why people are in education and that people care very, very deeply about, um, about the kids. So thank you for that. Um, we need to be thoughtful about what is the appropriate thing. I think that, you know, uh, teachers, administrators are very comfortable telling children no, you know, and, and this is another kind of a no, no, sorry, can't, can't always give you everything you want. How can we make it work in the next best way for, you know, in the next best way for you? You know, we, our district has policies that are, you know, anti-harassment, anti-bullying, anti-discrimination. There is no intention here to be in, you know, bullying, harassing. It's not, that's not the goal of this at all. But the goal is to make sure that parents are not excluded regarding their children. Um, I think, so, I guess I will leave it there. I think we need to be um, creative and thoughtful in, in this. And again, I, I would recommend that we take this to a policy committee meeting. Quinn, I'm not seeing anything on 0131.1 that requires committee. Um, I, do, I did see something in that policy that requires two reads that you can't introduce and pass in the same meeting that it needs to be read twice. So I think we are abiding by that. Okay, our procedure is to take any issues to the committee, have the committee discuss it, and bring it to the board. Is that in, well. So let's, let's, I would, I would, ask that we refrain from a debate with this and just address the board as a whole. Madam Treasurer, would you like to make a motion regarding your policy adoption? No, Jason. So what I'm asking for is for you as board president to either schedule this for September 18th or September 25th. <clears throat> um, I think you're, I think you're looking for a motion to send the policy to the to committee for review and then have that returned to the board proper. I believe that would be the motion that you'd like to Okay, make. great. Then I will make a motion to send the policy to committee for review. So we have a motion on the table. Do I have a second? A second. We have a first and a second. Any further discussion? Yes. Sir. So what we're, we're sending this policy here, this model policy to the committee? I think, like I said, I don't want to get into debate back well, and forth. What she made a, she, what is the policy, what is, what is the, what is the uh, motion say? She said she want, yeah, she, I believe it's sending this model policy to the committee. Yeah, you're correct. My apologies. Okay. So, we pay a company to handle our policies. Have you talked, i like to ask Karen, have you talked to Neola about a model policy from them? We pay, as a district, a company to handle our policies, to review our policies. Have you asked our Neola, our company, for a, for a model policy? Simple question. It's your yes Once or no. Once again, not wanting to get into debate. Well, how can we, that, how can we not discuss it if we don't so give the, the information to discuss it? It says discussion and possible action. That is what the, it says right there. So That's you why can't discuss this now? If you let, have items that you'd like to, to make statements on, please do so. I'm asking a question. Why aren't we using the company that this district pays 
for to handle our policy have we asked them for a model policy on this issue simple question ok is there an answer as far as i know no then i'm against this motion i am going to withdraw this motion ok i'm going to say what i'm going to say is that um, jason is the chairperson of the policy committee and that I believe that it's in Jason's authority to convene a policy committee meeting um, and put this on an agenda. I don't think that a motion is necessary for that. So I think that if discussion is complete, um, then it would be prudent to move on to community comment. No, I'm not done saying stuff. No, that's ridiculous. First of all, how long you been on the board? You don't know how things work? at all and now you're withdrawing it because I know why you withdrew it because I know why you withdrew it because if we voted on it it'd be three three it would go down that'd be the end of it now you're trying to delay this I'm guessing in hopes that people don't show up again this is ridiculous and now see there I don't have a board this is a discussion thing and I'm discussing with people that brought this up the problem is over there the problem that you allowed this to be put on here because it was demanded to be even though you as policy chair and board president should have said if you wanted it done the proper way, even though I think the reaction would be the same, this should go to policy committee. Why don't we set up a policy committee meeting? Then we'll bring it in front of the board. Instead, there is a potential for action tonight, which gives the community, what, the weekend to send emails and today, and yet here we are trying to prolong it when there's a little pushback. Do what you plan to do, and let's get on with it, because it's ridiculous that this is even forward and that we're as if we're doing some sort of favor to everybody when clearly it doesn't sound like anybody needs clarification on how to live their life. So the motion is withdrawn. Any other, any other discussion? Sure. But yeah, it, so then we will open to public comment. Uh, when I call your name, please step to the podium, state your name, your comments to three minutes. Uh, first. I, Jason, did you tell her that she's reading the written ones first or? Oh, I'm sorry. I, my my apologies. Yeah. I just um, I want to whatever you told. I just think you should follow the same yep. order. Okay. Written uh, comments come first. So. Okay. I don't think you can read from as long as you're able to be picked up on mic. Your mic is off. Is that on? Okay. Yep. Okay. Kara Kirchner, 4920 South 124th Street. Note I support a policy addressing gender identity in the schools, requiring notification of parents of their ch child's request to be identified as anything other than their birth name and gender. Parents have a right and responsibility to know how their children is their child is being addressed at school if it's different than their birth name or biological gender. If the school can call me to tell me that my child has been talking too much in class or any other reason we parents receive notification about their behavior, attitude, health, or well-being and rightfully expect me to have the responsibility to address that with my child then I have the same expectation and the school has the same responsibility to make me aware when my child is requesting to be called by an alternative name or pronoun. This isn't transphobia. Not everything is a phobia. Some things are just wrong. This is parental rights and responsibilities and district rights and rights and transparency. It's like the school agrees that I'm responsible medically, legally, and financially as the parent and legal guardian of my child until they tell me I'm not, or under whatever circumstances please them at the time when it comes to my child's well-being, mental health, medical status, and care. 
And this is especially true when teachers and staff want to go out on their own and plant their own seeds or views about gender ideology, politics, sexual, sexual education, etc. We can go down the path of history of gender ideology and Dr. Money and what actually happened to the Reamer twins. As the history states, his study and theory failed, resulting in David Reamer committing suicide. He transitioned back to being male after realizing he wasn't a girl as an adolescent. He was made fun of as a girl because he innately had a male gait pattern, wanted to pee standing up. This theory is being pushed on our children when it failed and has no basis in science. The research failed and biology and genetics prevailed. Gender ideology beliefs and practices have no place in our school. As stated earlier, I will emphasize again, parents have the right and responsibility, and school has the responsibility and transparency to notify me if my child is using a different name or pronoun than their assigned birth name and gender. And Thank from, you. <clears throat> is there any other yes, written I have, comments? I have a number of them, quite a few. Lindsay Grouchowina, 9713 uh, West Edgerton Avenue. I have three children currently in the district and a 2023 Whitnell grad. When my daughter was in eighth grade, I attended a school program of hers. While looking at the programs that were handed out, I looked down and saw her name listed as Sage. I stared at this and my initial thoughts wouldn't be appropriate to state verbatim in this forum, so I'll simply say I was annoyed. As a mom who saves every program, piece of art, etc., it annoyed me to see this random name. But I was also concerned that there was something I missed or that she wasn't telling me. I hope all my kids would agree that I foster a safe and supportive environment and openly have conversations and dialogues with my kids about these issues. So instead of enjoying the program, I was stuck with this feeling of guilt that I was missing something from my child. After speaking with my daughter, I can report today that I didn't miss anything. She said it was a nickname her friends called her. Even though 10 years from now, we will probably look at that program and laugh about the year her friends called her Sage. Today, I understand and emphasize with those initial feelings parents can have if they find out their child has been going by different pronouns or names <coughs> in school. That being said, I remind you that I have a safe, loving, and supportive home. Unfortunately, not every student can say their home life is the same. Some students may not have supportive parents or may not yet be comfortable discussing their gender identity at home. In these cases, denying them the use of their preferred name and pronouns within the school community would further marginalize and isolate them. Education should be a safe haven where every student feels accepted and respected, regardless of their home situation or parental guidance. I can understand wanting policies in place that require parental permission to change a student's name on any publications, programs, yearbook, etc. However, such a strict policy on what the student is called in the classroom may have severe consequences. In reviewing the model used as a proposed policy regarding this issue that was drafted by the Wisconsin Liberty Institute for Law and Liberty, I have some major concerns. There are several current lawsuits pending in the state of Wisconsin and at the federal level, level on both sides of this argument. Furthermore, the school districts in our state who have implemented policies similar to the proposed all started, sorry, 30 seconds? Or is, you're going. Oh, sorry. There are too many flaws and gray areas of this model, and while the courts fight to figure out where the rights of the parents to direct their children's education end and the student's right to privacy begins, I do not think the district should be taking such a hard stance on this position. We have to make sure we are not violating a student's right to privacy. We have to make sure we are not violating discrimination policies that are already in place. Furthermore, what happens in instances where one parent may agree to the name change and the other does not? Thank you. Who decides in those cases? Okay, then Jim Krause, 11330 Carroll Circle. I'm writing the board about item number five, student gender identity, parental notification and consent. I will not be addressing how certain Whitnell teachers are requiring students to state their pronouns to start the year, or how gay sex manuals have made their way into the high school library, nor how our ACT scores 
are one minuscule step above MPS. The pro proposed parental notification simply states, quote, parents have the right to determine the names and pronouns that staff use to refer to their children while at school. Staff shall not refer to or address minor students by a different name or pronouns that differ from their biological sex during school hours without written authorization from a parent, end quote. The opponents of this proposition have said, quote, it's transphobic and encourages the district to out kids. It makes our district an unsafe place for students to authentically express themselves. Not every home or parent is a safe place, end quote. First, I would ask, how is it transphobic to inform and verify with a the parent their son or daughter is transitioning? May I remind the board, you are an educational body, not a family. The most important people in a child's life are the parents. If the district isn't informing parents about student transitions, they are usurping, usurping the role of parents. Second, to the opponents, what makes your objective moral reasoning so much higher than parents? Do you know my own children better than I? Third, what a hyperbolic statement to say children are unsafe because parents might be informed their son or daughter is trying to transition. You are acting like parents who want to know what is going on in their son or daughter's school are also child <coughs> abusers. What a ridiculous implication. Moving forward, many on the board say they are conservative, but this should not be a partisan issue. However, if you are a board member, if you as a board member do claim you are a conservative, I pray you vote yes to implementing this policy and conserve parents' rights. If you do not vote for this policy, you are not a conservative nor a liberal, but a usurper of parental rights. Amanda Barber, 4080 South 97th Street. I'm writing to express my strong opposition to the proposed outing policy for transgender students in the Whitnell School District. This policy would restrict staff from using preferred pronouns and names of students without parental consent. I believe that this policy is harmful to transgender students. It would force them to out themselves to their parents, <coughs> which could put them at risk of discrimination, rejection, and even violence. It could also make it difficult for transgender students to feel safe and accepted at school. The American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Psychological Association, and the National Association of School Psychologists all oppose policies that require transgender students to disclose their gender identity to their parents without their consent. These organizations have stated that such policies can have negative consequences for transgender students, including increased anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation. Schools with inclusive policies that both protect and affirm transgender youth's identity are associated with positive mental health and academic outcomes. This is according to research published by the Society for Research and Child Development. Pe quote, people, children and adults, have a constitutional right not to have intimate facts about their lives disclosed without their consent. That includes, includes their sexual orientation, HIV status, or whether they are transgender. Children do not give up their <coughs> constitutional rights by enrolling in public school. Students also have rights <laughs> under federal law to keep certain information private and not to have that information revealed without their consent." Unquote. ACLU.org. The school board's philosophy states, quote, the board declares and thereby reaffirms its intent to establish policies and make decisions on the basis of declared educational philosophy and goals." Unquote. This policy does not establish a policy with any regard to educational philosophy or declared goals. I urge you to withdraw this proposed policy. Transgender students deserve to be treated with respect and dignity, and this policy would only serve to harm them. The proposed policy is an attempt to control rather than educate our community's students. From student Malia Overton, 5860 South 116th Street. The item that I'm concerned with is the student gender identity, parental notification, and consent. I'm a student at Whitnell High School. My name is Malia Overton, but my third name is Malexi. 
This action is incredibly inappropriate because you have the choice to risk trans kids' safety from school and their personal lives at home. If a student's parents are unsupportive of their identity, students could get kicked out of their homes and become homeless. Unsupportive parents might stop their children from coming to school because parents are mad at the school because the parents might blame the staff for allowing the child to express their identity. If students do, are not able to feel safe at school, it risks the child's mental health and not being able to focus on their academic work. I am one who identifies as a non-binary person, which is part of the trans umbrella. Even though my mother knows and understands how I feel and how much this means to me personally, I know other parents will not understand how it feels to be in a body that doesn't feel like your own. Please keep your students safe by keeping them seen and heard. Please do not pass this policy. You have the choice to keep your students safe. And Jessica Udell, 6457 South 122nd Street. Parents love their children and want what is best for them. If a child expresses the desire to identify as a different gender, use different pronouns, names, or would like to use different bathrooms or locker rooms than their gender assigned at birth, then the parents should be notified. These are our children, and as parents, we reserve the constitutional rights to not only guide and raise our children as we see fit, but, to, but the right to direct their upbringing and education. As parents, we are responsible for our children's mental health, physical health, and overall well-being. I feel that it is inappropriate for schools to keep parents in the dark. Adults who want to keep secrets from parents regarding their children have always been and will always be a danger to children. A notification does not change what that child wants, nor put them in danger. It simply, simply keeps the parents informed. Is that all? Thank you. Now, Sarah Blonsky. So, obviously, you retracted your motion, and you're going to discuss. Um, can I oh, just state your yep. name, your address? Um, I'm Sarah Blonsky. I live at 4303 South 118th Street in Greenfield. Um, I am a parent of a student at Edgerton. And um, my statement, I prepared ahead of time to address this policy, because that's what we came to talk about. Um, my... I strongly oppose this policy. My children have family members and friends who are part of the LGBT community, and this tells them that our family members and loved ones are not welcome in this community and in this district. Everybody, every individual should be allowed to choose how they want to be addressed. As parents, we do not own our children. They are still unique individuals. If my child chooses to come out as trans or choose a new name and tells their teacher, I want my child to feel safe and trust that their teachers will protect this information. I hope that my child also knows that I'm a safe person to confide in as well, as, as well. But their ability to feel safe and secure is more important than my feelings about it. I do not want a teacher to tell me this information against my child's wishes. I want them to know that school is a safe place to be themselves. As a school district, student safety should be our number one priority. This policy puts students at risk for bullying and abuse. When we send the message that a teacher has to get permission to call them by their name, it tells them that they're not valid, that name isn't valid. Growing up, I was a straight A student, <coughs> member of the Honor Society, AP scholar, and held on a job. I had parts of my sexuality outed to my guardians against my wishes. Luckily, it wasn't the school that outed me. However, in the months that followed, I faced verbal and psychological abuse, and on multiple occasions, I was locked out of my house with the threat of being permanently kicked out looming over my head. If you met my guardians, you would say they were wonderful, upstanding members of the community. Everybody to this day would say that about them. The trauma and, and fears and mistrust that I still carry around is all because I was outed. If school had been the ones to out me, I would have had nowhere safe to be. The idea that our schools could put students in this very same abusive situation I was in makes me physically ill. You don't know how parents will react if they are informed that their student wants to be called a different name or pronoun. 
You can think they're a great person. You have no idea. And as we heard from some of these comments, there are many people who believe that being trans isn't a thing. We have a responsibility to protect students and we simply need to put that as our number one focus. And we need to trust that a student knows themselves best, not us. Additionally, calling students by their chosen name without extra hoops or outing them is literally the least we can do. It shows them we respect them and that they deserve the dignity to live as their authentic self. We all deserve the dignity to live as our authentic selves. It also brings them joy and helps them reach their full potential. And that's part of our mission. Thank you. Thank you. Frank Carr. <laughs> My name is Frank Carr. I live at 11525 Parkview Lane. Our Whitnell Prospectus embraces the unique story of every child that, that we value advancement, belonging, and courage. As a resident and father of a Whitnell student, I'm concerned because this action would take away rights from an already marginalized and unprotected group. It is neither inclusive nor supportive. Causing students not to be their authentic selves and staff feeling pressured to act a certain way for only a specific set of individuals is concerning. I reflected with individuals who typically have different views from mine. We were both in agreement on this. They even said it was a slippery slope. What's next? We may not, not all understand the nuances. However, not all students have safe homes <coughs> and not all staff know family situations. Is it safe? Will school staff be skittish about talking to students for fear of making a mistake? Students facing any challenge may need to talk about anxiety, worry, confidence, and problem solving. To say staff can't support any related mental health concerns for a student who's transgender means we turn away from a struggling student. If the student feels safe with parents, then contacting and referring out is not daunting. If the student doesn't feel safe, we are putting them out to the wolves with no safety net or place to turn. This action item doesn't support staff retention. Two newly elected board members ran with a focus on retention. I hope all board members agree that it is important. Putting forth an action that places staff in a position to have, a, have to choose between following a policy or doing what's best for the child. How will new staff members and those who have dedicated years of service to this district feel about this change? The lack of inclusivity does not support wanting to retain staff but speaks to limiting their ability to do their work. This action item shows we don't trust staff to do their jobs of educating and keeping our students safe. It prevents individuals from wanting to apply to our district, knowing that our policies, policies are marginalizing, which in turn affects our students' learning. Lastly, as a parent, this action devalues the story of a group of our students. I would never want my son or any other child to walk into school every day knowing there isn't an adult that it can turn to for help or a listening ear without judgment. I also feel that this action item is shaming and instills fear not only in students but staff. With this being said, I urge the board to vote against this proposed policy. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Nicole Tentoni. My name is Nicole Tentoni, 10482 West Norwich Avenue, and I'm standing before you as a community stakeholder, a Whitnell parent, and a taxpayer in response to this agenda item. Um, I would like to ask for the care and consideration of an already vulnerable population of young people in our community who would be adversely affected by implementing this kind of action, a group that reports higher rates of depression, suicidality, and victimization than their cisgender peers. For many students in our community, including and especially those that this action specifically targets, school is a safe place for them to grow and thrive as they develop into the people they are. It is a place where they find support and encouragement. Their unique stories are embraced and celebrated by peers and staff through positive relationships and acceptance. 
I would like to speak to three parts of our Whitnell prospectus and ask, ask that you consider three questions. So number one, the Whitnell School District engages learners in safe, academically challenging, and supportive experiences so that all students can reach their personal learning goals. How does targeting a specific group of students and denying them the autonomy to simply use a pronoun or a name that makes them feel seen and respected foster a safe and supportive environment for students who statistically are likely already struggling? Number two, the Whitnell School District embraces the unique story of every child. Putting something in place that forces a child to tell an incomplete or abridged version of the story of who they are is not how we embrace the unique story of every child. How does allowing someone else to dictate how or which parts of that story can be told without their input further this initiative for all of our students? Number three, our values are advancement, belonging, courage. How does this action promote a sense of belonging for the students who would be impacted by this decision? The safety and acceptance of the youth in our community is the responsibility of all stakeholders, and I ask you to consider not whom this initiative seeks to help, but which of our children would be damaged by this action. And as a parent, I find it ridiculous that the district is wasting time on this unnecessary policy when there are so many other important issues to be addressed. Let's come together and support all students and help them succeed. Thank you. Amber. Handy? Okay. I didn't know if it was an H or an M. Happens a lot, no worries. Uh, thank you for hearing me. My name is Amber Handy. I live at 3972 South 96th Street. I have two children who are enrolled at Edgerton Elementary. And I agree with what many of the community members have said here already about the inherent dangers of this policy to many of our students, to their mental health, their physical health, and their security. So I'm going to speak about a couple of items that I have not yet heard mentioned. First, I want to talk about what a policy like this could do to all of our students, not just those who identify as a member of the LBGTQ community. This policy, if enacted, would tell all of our students that they do not need to treat their peers with dignity and respect. It would force the teachers to model for them that you can refuse to acknowledge who someone tells you that they are. That's not what I want my children to learn. Second, I think that this also uh, ties back, I'm an educator myself, uh, and I know that Maslow's hierarchy of needs tells us that students cannot learn if they do not feel safe. The students who are affected by this policy will not feel that they belong, they will not feel safe in their classrooms, that will affect their ability to learn, to grow, to develop, it will hurt the district in terms of academic outcome, as well as hurting those students and not preparing them for their future because they cannot be who they are, and they live in fear in that classroom environment. Finally, I would like to say that while my students, are, my children are still quite young, uh, and I don't know what their gender identities are yet because they are still growing, um, if someday it turns out that they are something other on the gender identity spectrum than what I understood them to be when they were born, I really hope that they feel safe enough to tell me. I really do. But if they don't, I really hope that they have a trusted adult that they can go to instead. And I can think of nobody better than a teacher somebody who works with them on a daily basis in the school, to be someone that they can go to, talk this out with, share who they are, and find the trust and respect they need to hopefully work up the courage, another one of our school values, to come and speak to me and my husband about it. Please don't take that away from our students. Please don't harm our students by enacting a policy like this, and please do not teach our children that it's okay to not identify people as what they tell you that they are. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie Hennessy. Jamie Hennessy, 5460 South 121st Street. Um, I have two children that go to school at Edgerton, a second grader and a kindergartner. And then I myself am also a teacher. I teach third grade in Oak Creek. First, I want to say that when I opened the board docs tonight and looked at the agenda, I was very disappointed to see that the model policy was from a well-known conservative nonprofit. Any policy that Whitnell enacts should not lean left or right and be from a group of any sort and be politically motivated or politically biased. We need to do what is right for Whitnell and what is right for our students. That being said, 
as an educator, we hold our teachers to a certain set of standards that are, they are evaluated on each year. Standard one, that teachers are evaluated on every year states. Teachers use knowledge of learners and human development to create responsive, inclusive, and respectful learning activities and environments that maximize learners' cognitive, linguistic, social, emotional, and physical <clears throat> development. We are holding our educators to the standard that they create an inclusive environment that supports their social and emotional well-being. You as a board need to be held to that standard as well. By enacting this policy, you are sending a message to a marginalized group that they are not welcome. You are sending a message that choices they have made about their own body are not okay. I ask, by not enacting this policy, what harm are you doing? You're not, but by enacting it, you could be causing harm. And I know you sat up there and thought, how is it that every family in Whitnell School District is abusive? That is not what people are saying. We are asking you to understand the possibility. Have you had to call CPS? I have. It's scary. We don't want to put any of our children in a situation where they are being neglected, where they are being abused, because it is not the majority, but it does happen. And we need to have safe spaces that protect all of our students. So please, do not enact a policy like this. Do no harm to our students. Thank you. Yeah. Richard Hansen. Hi, I'm, just, I'm Richard Hansen, 4218 South 97th Street. I have a child at Edgerton Elementary. I'm a stakeholder and a taxpayer. And I strongly, strongly urge the board to reject any policy that has the slightest echo of any of this, sorry, I need to watch my temper on this, any of this language which is directly damaging to children. Um, I'm hearing, I'm, I want to echo what the previous speaker said. I'm hearing a lot of language that paints it as we're making the assumption that parents are abusive of their children. That's not necessarily the case. There's a broad continuum here of things that happen when sensitive issues are opened up. You never know how a family is going to react. You never know how parents are going to react, especially in a very unique and sensitive issue like gender identity. Um, as an educator myself, it's I am responsible for creating safe spaces for my students. One of the first things students need in a safe space is to know that they can trust you. It is not about keeping secrets from parents, and I'm tired of hearing that language from people. It is about protecting children. Okay, we're not, it's not a clandestine secret when I do what is necessary to keep my students safe, when I do what is necessary to keep my children safe. Children are vulnerable, and LGBT plus children are uniquely vulnerable in this society. I'd like to see a policy, I'd like to see a, not a policy, I'd like to see a community that is welcoming to them and to all. I'd like to see our, play, our Whitnell School District grow along those lines rather than take this step against that. This is, this is a slide into bureaucracy. This is a slide into a cruel and hard policy um, that I can only see harming our children. Thank you very much. Luann Bird. Hi, uh, Luann Bird. I live at 5155 Brandon's Court in Hales Corners here. Um, I am just heartbroken that this came on the agenda. I agree with everything that's been said. You, you know, as a board, uh, you have to reject 
these special interest groups and create your own policies, which has already been stated. Um, also, as it's been stated, and I want to get into boardsmanship here, that you do follow the chain of command, that you do hear complaints, and that your job as individual board members is to build trust in the system. And when you hear parents saying that their children had to use pronouns, you send them back to the teacher to build that relationship. That's what parental rights is all about, and they already have them in this district. But as board members, sometimes it's easy to side with a parent rather than build that bridge between the parent and the teacher and the district. That's just good boardsmanship, and you should be hearing those complaints. That's your job. It's not your job to turn around and create a policy on every complaint and say, well, we're the policy makers. Well, it's very easy to micromanage in policy. And then you're not doing the big visionary work that you're supposed to be doing. And you can get down into the weeds or get into a policy like this one that is so harmful, as you, as you can tell. Um, I also want to mention your job as board members to tell the truth. And you can make statements at a board meeting and maybe you do out in the public that really represent the wrong thing by painting parents as violent, as was mentioned tonight. I just don't think that's your job. Um, and I don't think it's your job to put out misinformation. And this policy certainly does a lot of that. Just by bringing this to the board, I want to say there's a lot of assumptions that you would make. You would assume because you brought this policy forward and that the board president allowed this to come forward, you would assume that, well, parents don't have rights because that's what this is saying. You don't have them, so we need to create a policy that makes you as parents have rights. You would assume that teachers keep secrets. I've heard that over and over again. I have, I, I have never had a teacher keep a secret from me. I, if that's happening then, and, and a parent tells you that, you go to the superintendent if you have to. You, you go up the chain of command. But teachers do a great job in this district. They do a great job everywhere. They're not here to keep secrets. They're here, here to create safe environments for children, and that's what they do, and they're great at it. So as board members, you have to support your teachers, not be creating mistruths in a policy. It might have been unintended, but that's what that does. It creates a mistruth about educators. And um, it also um, creates a mistrust about gender because transgender is clearly attacked in this policy. And by just putting it on the agenda has already created a huge uproar and it says this isn't a safe and inclusive. Thank you. So finally, I just want to say we can take action tonight. Anyone can make a motion. It's already noticed that the legal thing we can do, even though we've had some discussion up here, any board member can make a motion and second it, and we can either pass this and we move on, which is I hope to see it and move on. <laughs> Thanks for all of the work that you do. And Finally, Chris Porterfield. Chris Porterfield, 4200 South 122nd Street, Greenfield. I feel so grateful to everybody who came out tonight and spoke against this <clears throat> policy. Everybody said it more eloquently than I will, and they touched on the nuance of it. This is not a nuanced thing. This is a cheap, easy thing. This is a thing from an outside group. They wrote the memo. They've already used this stunt in Keele, Kenosha, Madison, Eau Claire, all over the state. Outside influence is taking on too much control of this board. Stuff like this has torn communities apart. And I think that's the goal. They feed on the conflict like yeast on sugar. They're more interested in drumming up culture wars to anger their base. Than, are, than to be serious about governance. The best you get if you pass something like this is open it up to lawsuits. We, the taxpayers, will have to pay. This district has already had to pay out all kinds of lawsuits for poor judgment on this board. At worst, you'll do harm to some of our most vulnerable students. It's hard enough to be a kid without officials enacting policies at the whims of extremist groups to make it harder. This board tonight has repeatedly demonstrated and sowed mistrust in our teachers, our administrators, and our students. By doing so, this board 
is earning the mistrust of this community. Please do not consider a policy like this. Moving on to six, announcements. Yeah, get out and vote because obviously voting is what causes these issues or <laughs> creates them. So please get out and vote and be aware of who you're voting for and do your research as I know many of you did tonight. So thank you very much for coming and please get out and vote. Okay. Window Middle School PTO meeting. Six o'clock, right? Wednesday. First one of the year. Show up. Well, PTOs always need help. So if you're new, I'm a new parent to the middle school. I'll be there. I mean, I'd be there anyways, but uh, please show up and help them out. They're always looking for assistance in whatever way you can provide it. So six o'clock at the middle school uh, STEM space, correct? STEM space, 6 p.m. Wednesday. Oh, and they also have... Chick-fil-A, Eat and Earn. I don't. I didn't write that one down. Is it? Is it next next Tuesday? The nineteenth. Okay. It's at Chick-fil-A, so hard to argue with that. Greendale, Chick-fil-A, or West Dallas? Uh, I believe it's Greendale. Thank you. Um, HCE PTO meeting is on Tuesday the 19th at 6.30, and the HCE movie night is on the 22nd um, on the playground. Uh, Milwaukee Toys for Tots will be having a golf tournament on September 15th at 6 o'clock at Oakwood Park Golf Course. Uh, you can still sponsor a hole if you w would like to. It's $100 to do so comes from the uh, Franklin Common Council, so. Is it 6 a.m. or 6 p.m.? 6 p.m. Or a.m., I'm sorry. Yeah, a.m. So early uh, tea time. I don't know if that will keep people away. But. Uh, number seven, closed session. A motion to adjourn to closed session pursuant to section 19.85, subsection one of the Wisconsin statutes. Uh, subsection C and F to discuss one in independent investigation report of April 24th event two superintendent 2023-24 goals and three educator employment contract also the closed session minutes from August 28th of 2023 do I have a motion to go to closed session so moved I have the first a second and second uh, roll call vote please I have, so I have some oh discuss sir? this thing um, are we going to get a public number on the amount of money that's been spent on this independent investigation and when are we going to have some transparency with that and i will ask you the question i asked you in email several times why is the timeline for all these other things not been kept jason you have a motion in a second hang on so all those items will be brought uh, the total dollar amount will be when we get the final uh, invoice. So that will be something that will... What is up. the current number? Current number is... I will get you that when we get back into clo into open after, well, after. I just want to make sure that the public is aware of whatever this number is. And sure. They're spending the money to pay for this. Absolutely. So, so we have a first and a second and a roll call vote. 
I'd be interested in the answer to the other question as well, if you have it. What's that? About um, the reasoning behind the, the delays. In the there was communication and... No, there, was, there wasn't an answer. I asked a why, and I never got a why answer to why we are taking this long to do this when it was put forward that we need to have things completed by July, otherwise we would be on a delay. We are now in September. I never got a why or any ownership on why this wasn't done. Because we had communication errors as far as what, and this was something that was brought forward that, and I believe the superintendent would be able to agree that we are working to improve our communication back and forth as far as what our levels of expectations are and how we are missed as far as our as our conversations go with things that one side will think of one item and another will think of another and it leads to where things are not executed the way it should be but the board's job is to do the superintendent review i'm asking you why it hasn't been completed in the time frame that you put forward and said that need to be done it jason let's call the question So we have a first and a second roll call vote. And you have a motion to call the question. Oh, call the question. Do I have a second for the call the question? I'll second. And a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? No. 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 Motion fails. I can answer that question. Sure. I haven't answered the why. How about some ownership? Okay. Sure. Put it on me. That I will own it. It has not gone through the way I would like it to, to have gone through. And we are working to make it better, and we are going to get there. That's what I asked for. I asked for ownership, accountability, and transparency. And it shouldn't take five emails and an attempt to avoid the question to get a simple answer like that. That's all I have to say. You can go for the vote, unless anybody else has anything else. Nope. Roll call vote, please. Aye. Kevin? No. Cassie? Aye. Karen? Aye. Jason? Aye. Quinn? Aye. We have five ayes, one no, one, abs uh, one absent. Motion carries. And we are in closed session, or we will be in closed session. Thank you, everyone. We'll be returning to
And we are back uh, in open session, uh, following out of closed session. Do I have a motion to uh, accept the direction regarding educator employment contract as discussed in closed session? So moved. I have a first, do I have a second? Second. And a second. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Six, zero, and one absent. Uh, action uh, item letter A, 2023-24 superintendent goals. Do I have a motion to accept the goals? So moved. I have a first. Do I have a second? Second. And a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Uh, let's do a roll call vote on this. Aye. No. Aye. Jason. Aye. Dusty. Aye. Kevin. Aye. Motion carries five yeses, one no, one absent. Letter B, Neola semi-annual policy updates. Um, do I have an, a motion to accept the changes as presented by Neola? So moved. I have a first. Do I have a second? A second. And a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries six, zero, and one. Number nine, meeting debrief. So sure. I, I would hope that if we do have a policy committee meeting regarding the pre, uh, gender identity, that we would bring materials to that meeting that are not from any outside source that is a political action committee. That's all. Anyone else? Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Do you have a I have a first. Do I have a second? Second. And a second. All those uh, seeing no further discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.